Thank you, Avi. Yes, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, recent progress uh, in cryptography and the problem of obfuscation. Uh, this has been a problem that I've been obsessed with uh, since uh, my PhD years. Uh, and it seemed really stuck for a while. And only in the last few months, there's been really interesting progress. I want to tell you about the progress and uh, where things stand today. OK. So what's the, what, what's the problem we're interested in here? So the goal here, so what's obfuscation? The goal is to take a program or a code and to make it to keep the functionality of the code so it should still have the same input-output behavior, but you want to make it completely unintelligible. So someone who's actually looking at the code will not understand anything about you know, what the program does. The only thing we'll be able to do is essentially run it. I'll, I'll, I have some things to say about this in a minute. So uh, what's the goal? You want to take some program. Uh, hey. And uh, you want to convert it into another program, an obfuscated program with the same input-output behavior. But this thing should be like completely mixed or garbled. And someone who looks into it cannot understand uh, what's going on. OK, so this is the goal. It should have the same input-output behavior, but impossible to understand the internals of, of the code. OK, so here's an example. So actually, you know, when I first came across this problem, I thought it was very weird to me because I thought, for me, every code is, is obfuscated by definition. So here's a supposedly unobfuscatable code. For me, it looks obfuscated. And, you know, and here's an obfuscated version. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> You know, I, I would think the problem should be the opposite, right? To unobfuscate codes or to write, it seems much, I mean, that seems a very hard problem on its own. But people are actually interested in obfuscating codes. And the reason they're interested in it, at least in the real world, is because they want to make sure that uh, adversaries, hackers, uh, competitors will not be able to reverse engineer uh, their codes. So here are some, some examples where, where obfuscation is being used. So for example, you want to have like copy protection. So if uh, a big company, Microsoft, is releasing some code, you want, they want to make sure that the person owning the code has a certificate or you know, authority to run this code. So they insert some tests. Only if you have a certificate, you can run this code. But of course, one can delete this, you know, uh, this part of the code and just run it without it. And that's why they want to obfuscate it, to avoid this, to not allow uh, hackers or uh, to, to delete part of the code and still have the same uh, input-output behavior. It's also been used for uh, watermarking, where you want to make sure that if a code is stolen, uh, you can track where it arrived from. So you kind of put some watermark, it's called in the code, and you want to make sure that that wouldn't, should not be able, uh, that it should be hard to remove it. Uh, it has often been used for, uh, to, um, to do patching. So for example, let's say, Microsoft, in a, you know, unrealistic word, the world, uh, Microsoft releases a code with a bug. And then they want to patch the bug, OK? So let's say the code does something fatal on some set, sparse set of inputs. And they want to release a code saying, well, on these set of inputs, please don't run the code. But if they just release it, then an adversary can see where the problematic set of inputs are and exploit it. Because probably not everybody's going to patch at the same time. So they want to have this patch kind of obfuscated, so not to reveal where the vulnerability is. And in general, you want you know, to prevent uh, reverse engineering. It's also good for uh, job security. For job security? Yeah. Where if you are a programmer, your code is unencrypted. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point, though. <laughs> uh, OK, so, so indeed, uh, this is uh, used in the real world. There are actually a lot of, this slide is totally outdated, but I'm sure the, they're now probably better. On, I mean, there are other companies that obfuscate, but this is actually a problem that's, uh, peop that people uh, try to, I mean, they try to obfuscate. They obfuscate in some, some way uh, in the real world. OK, and it's a, it's a big problem that companies invest a lot of money in. So what's the state of the art? So uh, in the theoretical community, uh, this problem started uh, getting attention in a seminal work by uh, Barak et al. from 2001. They were the first people to consider this problem in the theoretical community. 
and they gave a definition, okay? So essentially the definition says the obfuscation should be an efficient algorithm, polynomial time algorithm, and that has the same improper behavior, and <coughs> what is, what's the security guarantee? Loosely speaking, they want to say, look, whatever an adversary can do with the code, whatever he can learn, whatever property he can learn, he can also learn just by running the code or with black box access to the code. Okay, so black box access to the code just means you can run the code but do nothing more. Okay, so a little more formally, what they required, they required to say, they, so what's an obfuscation? First, it should preserve the functionality, so it should have exactly the same input output behavior. And the security requirement they wanted is what they called virtual black box, which is essentially means whatever property pi of the code an adversary can learn, given an obfuscation, an efficient adversary can learn, given an obfuscated code, can also be learned given only black box access to the code. So if I just give you kind of, or you can, you know, feed inputs, get outputs, which of course you can do given the obfuscation, that's all you can do. So the sim, uh, you know, another simulator can learn the same predicate with essentially the same probability. Okay, that's essentially, but you know, this definition exactly is not so important. The bottom line is, is what you want from obfuscation is that you don't learn anything not even a single bit beyond what you can learn from just running the code, okay? Okay, so what's known? So what was known until very recently? So already in the seminal work of Bakhtang, they showed, not they didn't only give a definition, but they also showed that there exist some contrived classes of functions that are not obfuscatable, but not obfuscatable in a very strong sense. So let me show you Kind of the main idea of the function, the function is not exactly this, but the idea is what they want to say is uh, here's the contrived function. The function on some input, it thinks of this input as a function on its own, like as a circuit, as a Boolean circuit, and it checks whether this is a small circuit that computes the function. <coughs> okay, so it checks whether this computes the same function f, if so it reveals a secret, and otherwise it doesn't or it does something else. And the point is, well, the obfuscation is a succinct, small representation of the function, and therefore, if you have an obfuscation, you can learn the secret. However, if you only have black box access, you don't have a succinct rep representation, and therefore, you cannot learn the secret. Every succinct circuit, exactly. That's so, how it's defined. Th so, yeah, this function is defined, and first, it checks whether this is a succinct circuit, any succinct circuit that computes f. You can think of it like com it checks an average. So I, I, I didn't define it, uh, no, and I'm this is not. I'm worried about the size, right? I mean, it's possible. Good. So, right, so. Uh, I I'm not actually going to talk about the, the trick. Good. So, what Avi is pointing out said, okay, but what if the obfuscated circuit is really big? And if you think of this as a circuit, then just make the obfuscation much bigger. So, their actual counterexample is much more complicated because of this, but that's kind of the, the idea of the, uh, of, of the uh, negative result. And just the, the point I want to make here is that this is a very contrived class of functions. Function that takes an input, thinks of this input as a circuit and checks whether it computes itself, and that's not really functions that we actually care about. But still there's this negative result, unfortunately. And another thing I want to note that this negative result is fatal in the sense that it really reveals I mean, it can reveal everything, okay? So it's, uh, for, like this specific class of function is completely not obfuscatable under any meaningful definition, okay? And then, what about positive results? So we also have positive results, but they are very uh, uh, sad state of affair until recently. Uh, so what do we know? We know they're very simple functions <laughs> that can be obfuscated, but these are really simple, so like, point function, a function that on one point outputs <coughs> one and everything else zero, or generalizations of that, but not much better than, the p than point functions. So these are very, very small class of functions. And the question was, okay, but what about functions that we actually care about? So there's this kind of really small class, there's a contrived, you know, there's a contrived example, but for all the functions that we actually care about, we don't know what the answer, we didn't know what the answer is. We still don't know. But, uh, okay, so that's, that was 
the state of affair for a very long time, until like a few months ago. Okay, and then we start, we start thinking, you know what? Uh, actually, in order to have a really meaningful definition, what you want is to, the obfuscation to be secure also if there's an auxiliary input. And that was, that's kind of, um, in cryptography in general, this, like in, when zero knowledge was defined for those who are familiar, also people consider zero knowledge just auxiliary input because that's a more meaningful notion in reality where auxiliary information does exist. So we thought about this with, this is with, uh, with Shafi, uh, whether you can have obfuscation with auxiliary input. And there we got a, a very strong, like a strong negative result saying, actually many of the functions we care about, all the functions that have kind of high pseudo entropy, uh, whatever that means, but uh, like cryptographic functions, for example, you cannot obfuscate with, th so there exists some auxiliary input that contrived, I'm not saying it's out there, it's contrived, but you won't be able to, to have a kind of nice positive result saying whatever auxiliary input out there, you'll be able to obfuscate. That's not true. Okay, so that was kind of uh, uh, annoying. But then people say, you know what? Okay, so if you try to strengthen it to make it you know, like really what you want, you can do it. Let's try to weaken. Okay, so how about if we take like a really, the weakest possible definition? So what's a weak possible definition? So how about this? We want to preserve the functionality on average. Let's say we don't even care to preserve it on each and every input. Okay, so for most input, it should compute the same function. And this can be even relaxed further. How about obfuscation? I want to say, you know what? The only thing I want to say is you can't completely get rid of the obfuscation. So you can't completely invert uh, the function, unless you can do it with black box access. So for any function that's unlearnable, that you can't completely learn with black box access, you can't completely learn or invert, uh, you know, get rid of the obfuscation. Okay, so, okay, so good. Uh, this is uh, loosely speaking. But for example, you can think of it, let me give you an example. Uh, take a signing algorithm. So there's some secret key sitting there. The secret key is used uh, to sign messages. I don't want someone who's looking at the code to see, to see the secret key. He's just supposed to be able to feed messages and get signatures. And my goal is that the obfuscated circuit will just not, from looking at it, you won't be able to find the secret key. Okay, that's an, an example. And it, it doesn't really matter. What, what I want to say is that for this weak definition, the state of the art was exactly the same. The contrived functions, So, okay, the problem is if I give you a code, but you, I'm giving you the code, I want you to be able to compute. Okay, so think about, like for example, let's say I want to give you the ability to run a code. So let's say I want to give you the ability yeah, exactly. So for example, here's an example. Let's say I want to allow you to sign on my behalf, but only certain forms of, of uh, documents. Okay, documents for IAS accepted, whatever. Okay, so I want to give you a code that says only documents of this form, if you, in, if you feed it this specific form document, out comes my signature. If the document it does not have the correct form, you shouldn't be, it, it wouldn't sign for you. Now I want to give you this, this code because I want, you're my helper, I want you to compute it for me. I don't want you to be able to find my secret key and then, you know, sign that I owe you a million dollars. Okay, but I want you to be able to compute whatever I, so you should be able to do the computation, just not do more. The claim is that you should not be, and then you should not be able to do the computation on some other. Okay, so uh, exactly, so it should not be able to do the intended computation and move it and do something that's not intended. Okay? Okay, so, good. Okay, so that was the state of affair until very recently. But then very recently, a few months ago in uh, Fox, there's been a really beautiful breakthrough work of uh, Gargetal that gave a candidate for general purpose obfuscation. So they say, here's a way, take, give me any code, I'm gonna obfuscate it. And they gave a construction. Okay, now, okay, what can they say about it? Obviously, 
they can't claim that it's always good obfuscation because we know that there's some functions that you cannot obfuscate. So what did they say? They said that it achieves an indistinguishability type definition. And let me tell you what, they, what that was their assumption. That here, here's a candidate and we assume that it's an, good, it's an indistinguishable obfuscator. But what is an indistinguishable obfuscator? So what they assumed is that for, and there's also here a size issue which I'm ignoring, uh, but they assumed that an obfuscation for a class of family of functions f is such that for any two circuits of the same size, if you feed it to the obfuscation, they, you can distinguish. So whatever you can learn from this, you can also learn from this. Okay, now what's the meaning of this? So this is essentially equivalent, and again, this is high level, but essentially equivalent to saying, look, this is the best possible obfuscator. Why? Why is it the best possible? Because if this, for example, the C prime was itself an obfuscated code, then now it says, look, whatever you can learn from obfuscation of C is not more than what you can learn from obfuscation of C prime, which is definitely not more than you can learn from C prime itself. The obfuscation is just an efficient function on C prime. So in some sense, this says, look, we think that this obfusc obfuscation for class F is the best possible obfuscation. No, OK. If you this, is this is for exact functionality, so yes. Okay, so it's, uh, it's exactly the same size. You can always take an upper bound. It has to be the same size because if it's not the same size, the obfuscation is an efficient algorithm. So just by looking at the sizes, if C and C prime are totally different. No, it's just the So, so okay, so uh, you, can, you can relax the requirement of exact same size by padding. So you can always say, for example, if C and C prime of the size at most n to the seventh, then the obfuscator, the obfuscation is the same size. But then the, what you do is you take C and C prime, you think of them as a being of length, and you pad them, and now they're the same size, and then you apply the obfuscation. So the size issue is really, um, it's kind of a more definitional type. OK, but I just want to point out, if f is completely unobfuscatable, if this is like the contrived class of function that you, we totally cannot obfuscate, then all it's saying is that, look, all of them are equally bad. OK, so if f is the class of function, then no matter how you try to obfuscate it, you get the secret key out efficiently, then this is completely meaningless. OK, so even if so we have a candidate, we, so OK, so outline. So we have this work. It gives a candidate for general purpose obfuscation. There is this assumption that it's uh, indistinguishable obfuscation. So A, there's no proof. There's a, it's an assumption. Uh, so in some sense, it's a heuristic. And B, now you can think, OK, but uh, it th still doesn't really change our view of the world. So we still don't know for most functions, is it meaningful? Or can you just get the secret key out of them? OK, so we're still uh, in, in the dark. Let me just tell you, even after this talk, we're still in the dark. But uh, still, there's a, this is a really big uh, progress. So, so I just want to understand, the main progress here is just the definition? Is no. Definition? No, actually, the definition of indistinguishability was already in the original work of Bach et al. So in the work of 2001, they gave a bunch of definitions. It was kind of a study of obfuscation. And this definition was already there, OK? The main definition, the main uh, uh, breakthrough of this work is that they gave a candidate that if you apply it, you, it's not clear how to break it. And now I want to tell you a story about this. So uh, when that goes back to, to Avi's remark. So I worked on that uh, towards the end of my PhD thesis, uh, my PhD, and um, when I went to, when I was in the job market after my PhD, I, um, I interviewed in to research labs in Microsoft and IBM. And uh, part of my job talk was an obfuscation, and both places asked me to meet with their obfuscation groups. So apparently both these companies, at least then, spent a lot of money on obfuscation. They had these groups that tried to do obfuscation. And I was very interested. I was so happy because I felt like, look, in theory we, hadn't, we knew nothing. It was way before this result. And I was thinking, so how does they obfuscate? Really? I mean, we don't have any idea how to do it. How do you obfuscate? 
Obfuscate. So I was really excited. So I, at first place was micro Microsoft. And so I met with this uh, head of this group. And I asked him, so you know, what do you do? I was hoping that maybe I'll get some insight and we'll be able to use that you know, in theory. And his answer was just so pathetic. So he said, well, you know, first um, we change the name of the variables and we erase the comments. And then we add some junk code that does nothing. And that's essentially what they did. And I was just shocked. It's like, really? You know, <laughs> couldn't come up with anything better. But apparently, that's what they did. And then I asked them, so does it work? I mean, people don't hack your codes. Is it successful in practice? And so he was like, well, the truth is, um, if it's uh, usually if it, the, our codes are not hacked by within 24 hours, we consider it a success. Okay, so like it usually takes 24 hours until we get the first hack. I was thinking, oh my God, okay. So that was uh, I, uh, Microsoft. With IBM, they gave me very similar questions, and I asked them, so it doesn't work in practice, right? I mean, people ha hack your codes, right? And they say, yeah, it's usually within you know, two, three weeks. I'm like, oh, so you're doing a much better job than Microsoft. You know, their codes are hacked <laughs> within 24 hours. And so they said, well, frankly, probably a lot more people try to hack their codes, and not many people <laughs> are interested in, uh, you know, in our codes. So that's what's uh, the situation in practice. So we really didn't have any kind of... Exactly. That <laughs> that's probably a good uh, as as you know the best thing out that was out there until until recently. So the main <laughs> exactly hacked. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's essentially what the, that's their techniques. Appar that's what I was told. I don't actually know, but the, when I asked people in Microsoft. Right. Yeah. Mm. Uh, okay. So so uh, okay. So that was the candidate, and, and as I mentioned, we still didn't know whether whether you know most functions we're interested in can there is there at all possible to obfuscate or not? But we have some candidate, okay, and w which is that's kind of the big b breakthrough here. It's a candidate. We don't know if it's a good one, but at least. It's one that's not clearly breakable. Okay. And then really, like two months after this was published, uh, Balkelsky and Rothblum gave uh, si uh, a little simplified construction. So they simplified it a bit. And they proved like, that it's really secure, virtual black box. So like the original definition of Brack, that's saying all you can do is black box. Whatever you can learn is like what you can learn with black box. <coughs> but it's only assuming that the adversary does only what's called algebraic attacks. So I'm going to explain what that means. But also, another thing is that they needed an assumption uh, that they made, which they called the bounded speedup hypothesis. And what, so what is this bounded speedup speed hypothesis? It's essentially a strengthening of the exponential time hypothesis. So the exponential time hypothesis just says that you cannot solve SAT uh, or three CNFs in sub-exponential time. The bounded speedup is a strengthening of this. And it assumes essentially that there's no like super polynomial set of inputs on which you can test whether one of these solves, you know, three SAT or three CNF uh, with polynomial time adversaries. So essentially, it says that you cannot. Kind of worst case assumption. Uh, worst case assumption. Yes, worst case assumption. So how does that, how does that go into the theory? Uh, that's a. That yeah. So right, so usually in cryptography we rely on average case assumptions. This is a worst case assumption, but they managed to use this assumption to, in their obfuscation. This worst case assumption. So is this a paradoxical? Uh, um, Why is worst case? Let me take. Let me take this question offline because I think I'll need to. It's I, I yes, I, but by the way, it's not that's not the only place in cryptography that we rely on worst case assumptions. It like uh, well, worst case that are not known to be to be average case. Average case uh, I 
I need to think about that as well. But they do rely on worst case. It's a worst case assumption. Okay. Okay. But what I'm going to show you today is actually a much, a, a sim, a much more simplified construction, and w and we get security. We don't need this uh, this assumption of uh, of this bounded speed up hypothesis. So there's no assumption. It simplifies the construction, simplifies the proof. But we only get security against algebraic attacks. So I need to say what this algebraic attacks means. Yes. Oh. We oh we make we. Oh, OK. So by making algebraic attacks, we don't need to assume anything. But the assumption that you make only algebraic attacks is meaningful only if much work under, you'll see. This is, a strong, this is a strong assumption. If you make the assumption, you don't need to assume anything. But if people's MP, this assumption is totally meaningless. So I, I'm going to explain that in the next slide or so. Good. So, um, right, so this question is also meaningful. Let's say, that, uh, of course, you want the program at the end to be efficient and not, not to blow up the size by too much. But the obfuscator itself that takes, you know, some one program and generates another program, what if it runs in exponential time? You know, maybe, maybe we're okay with that. We do it only once, and now you run this obfuscated program, you know, a gazillion times. Even then, we don't know anything better than. It's regardless of, the, exactly, it's regardless of the runtime of the obfuscation function, of the obfuscator. Well, yes. The exactly, it's the existence of obfuscation code. Exactly. So what we show in, in these construction, they are efficient. So the obfuscator is efficient. But it's, I mean, I think it would be an interesting result even if the obfuscation was inefficient. But usually when we do, when we construct things, it's, in crypto, at least, it's kind of easier to construct. Cons you know, the things are constructive. So that's, but uh, that wasn't requ necessarily a requirement. I mean, practically, it's a good thing. But uh, theoretically, it's interesting, even if the obfuscator was not uh, efficient. But here, it is efficient. OK, so let me say a few words about what do I mean by security only against algebraic attacks. So we're limiting the adversary. We're not allowing him to do everything he wants. We only allow him to do algebraic attacks. So wh wh what does that mean? So let me say here, really loosely speaking, what it means. The, um, in this class of, uh, of the way the obfuscators work uh, in, in, the, in, in the three uh, works that I mentioned, is you take a circuit. The way to think about it throughout this talk, I mean, not, you can think about like there's a circuit, there's a secret key. Okay, and this, is, just for simplicity, it doesn't have to be this way, but this is a secret. The S is what's secret. And the S affects, of course, the functionality. And you want to hide S. OK, and you want to hide more than S, but at least think you want to hide S. The way the obfuscator works, it essentially encodes this S or encodes you know, this program. So there's some encodings here. And that's kind of the, 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 what's sitting there, what's um, hardwired to this obfuscation circuit. And these encodings come from some algebraic structure like a group, or it's more than a group, but I think it was some algebraic structure. And the assumption is that the adversary, the only thing he can do with these encoding is what's allowed by the algebraic structure. OK, so for example, if it was just a group, then what he can do, he can you know, multiply elements in the group or do the group operation and check whether you know, whatever he got is, you know, and do some checks, whatever the group allows him or the algebraic structure allows him. In our case, w our algebraic structure, as we'll see in the next slide, the adversary can add and multiply encodings, and he can check whether the encodings are encoding of 0. That was, that's what our algebraic structure will allow the adversary to do. So I'm going to let me say a few, a few. In the next slide, I'm going to say a few words about this algebraic structure. But before I do even, you can say, OK, but uh, is this meaningful? I mean, maybe you can do more than what's allowed by the algebraic structure. And my answer is that I don't actually know if it's meaningful. OK, and for example, for these counter examples, it's not meaningful. OK, so for example, sometimes he can take the program. He doesn't do operation, just feeds it into the circuit as is and gets you know, a secret key out of it. So I, I don't know if it's meaningful, but it's, um, 
it does give you an intuition. Usually, these algebraic attacks is kind of uh, the easy attacks to do, or, or you know, what comes to mind. So it just means that for most, for many functions, the the natural attacks won't work. Okay, and this has been this line of work. There's been a lot of work on this, uh, trying to prove uh, security in kind of generic models. Uh, so it's not it's 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 a type of proof that has been used in the past. There's a lot of work on generic group model. This is more than a group. It's a more rich algebraic structure. But still, it's the same idea. Or even this is reminiscent of random oracle models, where in cryptography we use hash functions, and we assume that this is just a truly random function. That's kind of a random oracle type assumption. So this is kind of uh, another uh, assumption in this line where we idealize uh, the, the groups or algebraic structures or hash functions that we work with. OK, but let me now be a little more precise so you'll be able to understand. So what we actually use is what's called a multilinear map. This is a new, uh, another new breakthrough result in cryptography. So multilinear maps is some algebraic structure that I'll explain what it is. It was proposed by Bonin and Silverberg. So they wanted, they said, what we want is a multilinear map. We, the first candidate for multilinear maps was only very recently, again, all this kind of new thing is from the last year. So this was by Garg Gentry and Halevi. They gave a candidate for multilinear maps. And this is a real gold mine. Okay, so there's a lot of things we can do with these multilinear maps. And let me explain what, a little more details what these are. So let me start with just kind of the discrete log assumption in cryptography. So in cryptography, there's a famous assumption called discrete log. Essentially what it assumes that there's a group G of prime order P Think of P as really big. It's like a k-bit uh, uh, number. And uh, you have a generator. And the assumption is that you can encode, think of it, it's a group with a multiplication operation. And the uh, assumption is, is that you can encode x by taking g to the power of x. And this is a one-way encoding. So you can't, given g to the x, you can't find x. Okay? But you can add an exponent. So this is an encoding of x. You can add encodings, but you can't multiply. Okay, this is kind of discrete log. It's used all over the place in cryptographic system and digital signatures and so on and so forth. But the fact that you can only add limits the usability of, of this. Okay. And then there's what's called bilinear maps. Okay. Here what you can do, it's the same thing. You have a group of prime order P, big prime P. Uh, you can encode an element in the same way. You can only add, but you can do one multiplication. OK, so you can take g to the x and g to the y, apply a bilinear map, and get an encoding of x times y, but that's in another group. OK, and this is instantiated using elliptical, elliptic curves. And I'm not going to go into it. I'm just saying it exists. And you can assume that it's one way, and you can make other assumptions, stronger assumptions uh, on this group. But here you can, you can multiply. But you can only, only multiply once, because once you're in this group, you can't do any more multiplications. But what Bonnet and Silverberg asked, they said, maybe you can have groups where you can continue. So you know, this is group one, you go to group two, and you can do another bilinear map on group two and go to group three. And you can do another bilinear map and kind of continue. So that's the problem they posed. But you know, we didn't have any candidates until very recently. So very recently, there's the work of Gargatal, who gave multi, oh, sorry multilinear maps, groups that have multilinear map. So what's this group? So they suggest a bunch of groups, g1 up to gt. G, t is like for target. That's the last group. Each one has a generator. Again, we have an encoding. For, for each group, you can encode an element. And you can take for each group i, you can add within the groups, exa exactly like uh, as before. But now you can take an element from group i and group j and multiply its encoding, and you'll run into group i plus j. Okay, so you can multiply, but up to group t. So you can't do it inf infinitely. Okay, so every time you take something from group i, group j, you go into group i plus j, and then coding multiplies. Okay, and you can test. So, okay, so what's the assumption on this? You can encode. The idea is from this, you don't learn anything about x. 
Okay, so you encode, but it doesn't reveal. It's, you can think about it. It's like encrypt. It's almost like encryption. What do I mean? Or I don't know how many. How many have heard the term fully homomorphic encryption? Just so I. Okay, a lot. Okay, good. So uh, you can think of it as like a fully homomorphic encryption, or homomorphic encryption that you have an encrypt. Think of this as an encrypt an encryption of X. So you don't learn anything about X, but you may be able to test whether it's equal to X. But other than that, you don't learn anything. Okay, so if it's random, supposedly you don't learn anything. And you can add and multiply. Okay, but the only, the reason it's, it seems harder to do than encryption, in some sense, it's not really, what I'm saying is, is intuitive, intuitively it seems harder, is that at the end, you should also be able to test whether you got a certain element. Or the, what, in this case, what, what you'll be able to test is whether at the end you got encoding of zero or not. So you can add, multiply, add, multiply, but then you can also test something. And with just encryption, you can, I mean, unless you have the secret key. But just with encryption, if you don't have the secret key, you get garbage, garbage, garbage. You can't, you can't test anything. Uh, no, T is only polynomial. Okay, so the candidate we have, T is polynomial. Uh, oh, and uh, another way to think of it, which will be useful in the talk, is that um, this, the map takes T elements from the first group and just maps it to the target group T. I mean, it's, ju it's just a different way to think about it, but I'll use this uh, just to uh, it'll make it easier. So you can take at most T elements encodings, X1 of the XT, and you map to the target group, this is in GT, you just get the multiplication. So can you uh, take an encoding of X in group I and move it to an encoding of X in group J? Okay. If we had this exactly, yeah. then yes. Unfortunately, we don't have this. What we do have is kind of a dirty version of this. And this dirty version is this encoding does not look at all like this. It's actually a randomized encoding. And we don't know how to move elements. <laughs> so it's, what we do have is much. You know, I want to multiply it from G1 to zero. Okay, you can multiply. Okay, so the Avi's question and Noga's uh, question as well is, first question is, can you move from group I to group I plus one? So if I have G, to G if I have encoding of X in group I, can I get encoding of X in the group I plus one? If, if it was perfect, not, uh, in the group 2i, you can, yes, yes. So if you had this, then the answer is, of course, just take your encoding and comma g1, and you'll get g1 to the 1, and you'll get gi plus 1, x. The thing is that it's not clear that you can, on your own, c find an encoding of 1 in group 1. So uh, that's what I'm saying. They, we don't have this ideal version. Okay, we have a very dirty version. And actually in our version that we have, the candidate that's out there, it's hard to find an encoding of one. Okay, so, so the, <laughs> the situation, this is a really, I'm oversimplifying a lot actually, but uh, I won't be able to use the exact candidate that we have because it's just complicated and, and uh, not very nice. But maybe, you know, things are moving fast in this field, so maybe we'll have nicer candidates uh, soon. Okay, so, but let, I, throughout this talk, that's what I'm thinking of a little bit. Not really, but that's what to, to keep in mind. Okay, so the first observation is that these multilinear maps are really fantastic for obfuscation. Yeah, can you tell us what the groups are? No, no, that's, a, that's, a that's, that's an obfuscation, uh, obfuscated part of the talk, yeah. Uh, yeah. But let me first tell you why multilinear maps are really call for obfuscation. It really seems like the tool we needed. So let me, here I'll, let me obfuscate things for you. Here's the idea. Take any circuit that has a small degree, okay, polynomial. So again, going back to Noga's question, the multilinear maps only allow to multiply this T, the target group, is a polynomial. It's, there's only polynomial in many groups. So you can't multiply more than polynomial more than a polynomial time. You need to decide what the polynomial is and you have that for that polynomial. We don't have more than that. But take any arithmetic circuit of polynomial degree over, over ZP. Okay. What's P? P is a big prime. It's the prime that I have a multilinear map for. 
uh, p is going to be exponential and it's a k bit prime where, or n bit prime is what to think of. Yeah. If p is small, it's only polynomial size, then, then coding is not, is not safe. OK, so p is a big integer. It's an exponential size integer. And let's say we had an arithmetic circuit that has over, over zp, but of polynomial degree. So here's the idea of obfuscation. What I'm going to do, I'm going to take this s. Let's think of it as like s1 up to sl and zp. And I'm going to encode each one in the first group, in the kind of the basic group. And now, when I want to do some computation, I'm just going to do it kind of in the group, in the, exp in the encoding. I'm going to add the encoding, I'm going to multiply the encoding. And I can multiply up to polynomial many times, so I'm, I'm good to go. Uh, right. Right. So good. Okay. Good. Uh, it is one. It's going to be. Oh no. Actually, it's in ZP. Good. So let's assume for a so for this result, assume that I'm you can encode one. So I'm going to give an encoding of one as kind of part of my obfuscation. Uh, yes, and that's what what's going on here. Okay. So now this result, what it gives you, here's a way where I can obfuscate any circuit, uh, any family of functions that only test if this circuit is zero or not. So again, I can't, I can't I, once I have C of the answer, I, I, I can't uh, undo the encoding. That's a hard problem. It's a one way. But I can test if it's zero. So now if the function I'm interested in is whether the output Given x, whether the output is zero, is zero or not, I can obfuscate that. Alison, did you have a question? Yeah, at this level, is the framework uh, the same as the construction that came before based on the same thing? Are you talking about this or the, one, the construction that I'm actually going to show? This is not, OK. So this works only for a very specific class of functions. When I started, I promised obfuscation for general purpose. This is not general purpose. And here, I'm using. It, it doesn't follow, it's very different from the general purpose obfuscation. So th this is just kind of motivation to show you, look, this is trivial, like multilinear maps is really a way to go to do obfuscation. And here's like a result that we have, here's how, do, and we have a proof, not, no, you don't need algebraic, it's, it's general, you know, we have proof of security under cryptographic assumptions. Okay, so if you assume that this, you know, that this encoding is one way, then we can already show that this obfuscation is good in some sense. It doesn't reveal some inf it doesn't reveal a lot of information. Let me put it this way. But I, I want to stay vague. Uh, have a very simple obvious case also for this type of, of uh, function. Yes. So I will look at the circuit, near the obvious case. Uh -huh. Okay, the zero. But if it's not, no, but no, but you need to give me you need to give me a circuit that I feed x. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Now it's x. Okay, so given x, you want to say whether x makes the circuit. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. OK, so this type of obfuscation we did not know how to do before we had the multilinear maps. But it seems like when you look at it, it seems like, well, you're really using the fact that you're low degree. It's uh, OK, uh, yes, with multilinear maps, you can add and multiply, but you can only multiply polynomially many times. And it seems kind of, so are we stuck in polynomially many, in, in polynomial degree? And also know that this is over ZP. This is not a very strong result in the sense that these are over ZP. And the only thing you can test is whether it's zero or not. So it doesn't, you can't really compute these circuits. The circuit you can compute is a circuit that tests whether an input x is a zero to of this, that the output, if, whether the output is zero or not. OK? But it seems it's pretty inherent. I don't know, it seems like OK, but uh, because of the structure of the multilinear map that it does algebraic operation over zp, and it's bounded to polynomial degrees, is this kind of the limit of, of what you can do with this technique for, for, for obfuscation? Okay, and what I'm saying here is, of course, very high level in, in intuition. But well, let me just note that, just a curious note, that this is really extends 
what was known for like the original, original obfuscation. So the original obfuscation for point function, this is a work of Canetti from 98, even before obfuscation was defined, but now we can think of it as obfuscation, uh, was he said, okay, I wanna kind of obfuscate, and I'm using the terms he didn't use then, but uh, if I wanna obfuscate a point function that an input s outputs one and otherwise outputs zero, I'm just gonna give you kind of a random generator to the s in, in, a, in a, a group, no multilinear, no bilinear, just a group, and an input x, you'll take g to the x and check whether it's the same or not. So that, I just want to point out that it's really a generalization of the obfuscation that we already have, but just we have a richer algebraic structure and it gives us richer families of functions. There's no new, new ideas here. Is it the initial proposed for two bits that are so? No, <coughs> no. So apparently if, if you can have t to be as big as you want, then you won't get really a one-way encoding. Okay, but you can say, you say, you say if it's bounded. So, so, t, so the number of multilinear, the number of multiplications you can do. Okay, so t means the number, bounded the number of multiplication. You can imagine more than polynomial, right. And we just don't know. It would be meaningful, but we don't know how to. And then it would help here a lot, right? It would help here a lot, yes, so if you can. You just, that would be enough. Exactly, 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 yes. Okay. But today I want to tell you more about obfuscations for all circuits. And I'm following the work of Gal Getal, and here's what, what they did, and we're gonna improve on that. So what they did, they first construct an obfuscation for just NC1 circuits. So NC1 circuits is just Boolean <coughs> circuits of depth order log n, where n is the input size. Okay, so it's shallow circuits. And then they show how to bootstrap it to get obfuscation for all circuits. So the first part is already done because the polynomial can be defined. Good, no. That, actually this part, that's very, I'll, I'll get to that. It seems like uh, this part, oh, you're saying, oh, it's only log n depth, it's polynomial degree, so don't we have that? And then all we need to bootstrap? The answer is no, and I'll show you why. It turns out that this bootstrap is actually very easy and I'm gonna say a word about it, I don't wanna spend much time, but this part is really the main thing, and I'll look, I'm gonna explain why. So, actually I don't wanna, due to lack of time, I don't wanna say much about how to bootstrap, so let me just say a word, probably most of you won't get anything, but some of you will, so I'll just say a word about it. The way they bootstrap is they say, the idea is, let's just encrypt, this is not encode, it's an encrypt, let's just encrypt the circuit using fully homomorphic encryption for those who, knows, who know what that means. And so this doesn't give you any information because it's uh, encrypted. And, but then I'm gonna also give you the decryption function obfuscated. The decryption of uh, FHE scheme, the, the fully homomorphic encryption schemes, we know the decryption circuit is actually an NC1. It's a shallow circuit. And then the idea was, okay, you take your X, Fully homomorphic encryption allow you to do all the operations inside the encryption. So without knowing anything, you can generate an encryption of C of X, and you feed that to the decryption and you decrypt. That was the, that's the idea. This, of course, does not work because you can just feed the encryption of C and decrypt it. So they do something a little smarter. What they do is they, you encrypt, you get C of X, but this guy is an obfuscation, not just the decryption, but it also checks. It checks that you, know, that you give him all the wires and you give him X and it checks that really what he's decrypting is you know, uh, correct computation of X and C. So this is a very big circuit. It gets all the wires, but it's shallow because to check consistency of all the wires, you can do kind of an NC1. You can do things in parallel. So, I know this was fast and probably a lot of you didn't get anything of, out of it, but there's a way to do it using cryptography, using polymorphic encryption. It's a pretty standard technique. So the main problem is actually getting obfuscation for NC1. And let me show you the idea and the problem, why it's hard and why, how, how it's solved, but with a lot of cheating, okay? Because uh, I'm already cheating in the encoding, in the multiple linear map, so we're gonna continue to cheat. Okay, so the first thing you, is, okay, what is NC1? It's 
circuits of log n depth, order log n depth. And you can think of them as arithmetic circuit of polynomial degree, exactly like Avi said. So didn't we solve the problem? Because for circuits of polynomial degree, we can encode and do computation. The reason we didn't solve the problem is because this is a polynomial degree over GF2. It's not over GFP. OK, if it was over GFP and all you cared is whether the output is 0 or not, then you could. Then, then yes, that would work. But this is a much, more, much richer class of functions than what we had before. So this does not work. But we still want to be able to take NC1 and to do the trick to it. Because that's kind of all we know how to do in some sense. So here's the really nice idea of Gargetal. We said, let's use Barrington's theorem. So what is Barrington's theorem? Barrington's theorem, you can think of it as, as the following. It shows that you can represent any circuit in NC1, you can represent as a branching program. So what does that mean? You can represent it as a bunch of pairs of permutation matrices of actually in zero permutation matrices on five elements. And the way the computation works, when you want to check whether, let's say, this circuit C on input x equals 1, you take the corresponding matrices. So here you take you know, A1 of x, i. You, you, each pair of matrices is associated of an, with an index of the input, okay, an index between 1 and n, i1, i2, and so on. And when you, you take one of them depending on whether x, i1 is 0 or 1. You take one of them whether, depending on whether x, i, whether x i2 is 0 or 1, so on and so forth, and you multiply them and you check if you got the identity. If you got the identity, c of x equals 1, otherwise it's 0. That's Barrington's theorem. Okay, it allows you to represent uh, NC1 circuit in this way. Actually, it allows you to represent any circuit, but this L grows exponentially with the depth. So if you want polynomial size branching program, that's why you're stuck with log, log depth. Okay, why did we make progress? Because this is an arithmetic operation uh, of, 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 of uh, polynomial uh, uh, degree, and this is true kind of over the integers. So it's also true over ZP in some sense. And that's why it seems like we made progress. Okay, so what's the idea of the obfuscation? You take this branching program, so you think of your circuit, so now don't think of NC1 circuit, think of branching programs. I'm going to show you how to obfuscate branching programs. Okay, so you take this branching program, here it is, and code it. And now do all the, encode it using kind of the first group, do all the operations, you know, in the, in the encoding and check if you got I, if you got the identity. That's the high level idea. Oh. So what did you say, G iteration to the power of the matrix? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Noga. What do I mean by G to the power of a matrix? I just mean oh, each, each element, element by element. Yeah. So it's, there's 25 elements there, it's five by five. P encode each element. Thank you. I meant to say that, but I forgot. So you just encode each element. It's just a shortcut. Okay. So does it, is it secure? Does it really hide the matrices? So n p dot a r. Thank you. This is totally insecure because, <laughs> uh, as Sanjeev was, I think, about to say, the entries of a are are just zero one. It's a permutation matrix. So this is totally not secure. I mean, what we can hope. This can, would hide if it was random in ZP. It's not random in ZP. So this is, does not, doesn't do anything, actually. But it, you guys are a smart audience. So OK, yeah, so what we, the trick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So once again, we're, we're going to use a, Killian has a very beautiful uh, randomization technique. And the technique is the following. He's, the idea is, don't put here A's, put here, uh, randomize the A's. But in a way that you won't, you'll still have the correct functionality. How do you randomize it? So you just, the B's are just going to be kind of a, a random version of, of A. And uh, let me explain actually how you do it. So this is a 
the Bs. What we're going to do, we're going to take the As, multiply here by a random matrix R1 in Zp 5 by 5, multiply this by the R1 inverse R2, and so on and so forth. Now when you multiply, all the Rs are going to... Uh, are going to cancel, and you're going to be left with the multiplication of A's, which is, and then you check if it's identity or not. What did we gain here? Now, each B on its own is really random. Together, of course, there are correlation, correlations, but each B on its own is random. So, so you obfuscate exactly the way the obfuscation works is exactly the same way. The A's don't need to be in 0, 1. They can be random in ZP, as we did here. And now the question is, okay, do we get security? So first, you know, does this actually hide B? And the answer is yes, because each B on its own is random. Together, of course, there are correlations, which we'll need to deal with, but at least each one on its own is random, so it seems like, you know, we made progress. And we did make progress, but we still don't have security. Okay, we made progress, but it's not enough. And the reason is, there are many reasons. For example, what you can do is check whether these two are equal. They're the same matrix. And this actually can give information about the original program. It says it's exactly, if they're equal if the A's are equal, because I multiply both of them by the same R, and if the A's are equal, it can actually give you some information. Another thing you can do, so that's kind of, you can do partial evaluation attacks. You can take partial parts and check if, you know, they're equal. And another thing is what you can do is do what's called an inconsistent evaluation. So what does that mean? So note, I1 can, be, can equal to I2. I mean, the, the indices, there's repetitions. So many of them check, you know, whether that, check X1, the first bit of X or the second bit of X. And what you can do is one time, when, when the adversary, what he can do is he can evaluate this branching program, check whether it's identity. But let's say if these two are the same, he can one time check, put here, th say, okay, no, X1 equals one, zero, and here say X1 equals one. So what, essentially the problem is that he can be inconsistent with, ev with his evaluation. I'm going to say more about this in the next slide, in soon. But the way we get, we get around these attacks is uh, we use different groups. So we don't encode everything in the same group. We use different groups. And um, what we use essentially is an asymmetric version of multilinear maps. And the candidate that we have, thanks to Gargetal, is an asymmetric version, or can be thought of an asymmetric version. So uh, we have it. And let me tell you what it is. So instead of just assuming that we start with the group G1, and every time we multiply, we kind of get increase up to GT, what we actually have, the, the construction, what they actually give us, is actually exponentially many groups. So there's some universe L, 1 to L. L is polynomial. But you can look at all the subsets of L. So you have a group corresponding to each subset. And what you can do within a group for any subset, you can add the encodings. I mean, you can, uh, yeah, you can add the encodings. And you can also multiply. But you can multiply only assuming the sets are disjoint. So if, this, if S and T are not dis disjoint, this would not pair. This will not work. It will give you garbage. But if it's disjoint, then you'll get the multiplication in the union. So again, as you see, you can't do more than polynomially, more than L multiplications here. Because every time you grow, your set grows. OK, so for any two disjoint sets, you can, you can uh, multiply. So you have a bilinear map but it takes you to the union of the sets. And more generally, you can take any you know, sets, S1 up to SL, that are mutually disjoint, and you can multiply uh, these elements. Well, this L does not have to be the same as this L, sorry. But you can take any set of, of sets that are mutually disjoint, and you can multiply the encodings this way. OK, so this is what we use. And why is this helpful? So that's kind of the new observation. So what we use is different sets for each encoding. And we, the sets we use, we, we generate them in a specific way. It's not just random sets. We generate so that 
every time you take an x and you kind of look at the sets corresponding to the x, they're, they're, they'll be disjoint. Yeah. Disjoint. So you can multiply. You, you have to just, this is just for correctness, for to be able to compute, to get the input output behavior. You, I'm, I'm going to take the, the obfuscation, the way it, it, the way it goes is I'm pairing. I'm pairing all these. So let's say the x is zero, all, the all zeros, I'm going to pair all these. But in order to pair them, all these s's need to be disjoint. So I'm going to make them disjoint so that I'll be able to do the pairing and get the correctness. OK, so for any x, if you look at all these sets, which correspond to the pair, which I'm going to pair together, they are going to be disjoint. So I can take the union, and when I, when I multiply them all together, do the pairing <coughs> together, then I get, um, then, then I get, I, get uh, I, I, I can do it, and it works. OK, why, why is this helpful? So the idea, the way I'm going to choose these sets is so that, so let's say i1, i2 is the same. This is the fifth bit of x. Here, you look at the fifth bit of x. If it's 1, you're supposed to you know, take these two, multiply these two matrices. If it's, if it's 0, you're supposed to multiply these two matrices. If it's 1, you're supposed to multiply these two matrices. I want to make sure that the adversary gains nothing by multiplying this and this, for example or vice versa. So the idea, so I want to make sure that if he tries this, he won't get anything meaning useful for him. You want this one to plus five. Exactly. So OK, one way, yeah. So one way is, exactly, I'm going to make them intersect, for example, here. Note that these two don't intersect. But, uh, a, but that's also good enough, and I'll explain why. So what I'm going to, I'm going to, the, the, what, what we use is what we call straddling uh, sets. Which essentially the idea is I'm going to make sure that if you want, look at, the, look at the indices corresponding to, let's say, you know, bit number five. Look at all the places where you look at bit number five. Let's say it's here and here. Okay? Then I want to say that if you look at when bit number five is zero, the sets you'll have is, let's say, one, two, three. There's some universe. If you look at the, if bit number one, if bit number five is one, and you pair, you get 1, 2, 3. But the only way to get 1, 2, 3 is by taking these or by taking these. You won't get 1, 2, 3 by these two or by these two. You can't even pair. You're, you're out of luck. You'll get a totally meaningless thing. And these two, maybe you can, but you won't get 1, 2, 3. You get 1 and 3. You're missing one. That, that will ruin it for you, for the adversary. More generally, just to generalize this a bit, suppose these three are all the, you know, the indices that look at bit 5. Then I'm going to straddle it. I'm going to put here 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5. Let's say here now the universe is 5. And again, the only way to get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the set, the union, one, the g of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, is by multiplying all these or by multiplying all these. OK, if you try to mix and match, you'll, you won't get the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I'm going to take I kind of an independent set for each index. So this is for the bit 5. For the bit 7, I'm going to have another one, but that's independent, another copy in some sense. So this idea allows me to, and I'm not going to say why. Oh, I'm totally out of time. OK, sorry, let me finish. So it, this, this allows me to get consistent evaluation and avoid the partial, in, uh, the partial a, evaluation attacks, so we can prove that. But in order to actually prove security against algebraic attacks, this is not enough. OK, so I'm not going to say, the problem is actually, OK, I'm not going to say more. I'm just going to say that in order to, to prove security, we don't use branching programs. We, we use a generalization of it, which we call dual, dual input branching programs. That's what we need. So instead of having a branching program, we assume that each, each matrix looks at two indices. And that's important for us. It's very easy to take a regular branching program, convert it to a dual input branching program. And what's important for us is that each two indices are, appear here somewhere. So you can move from, one, from regular branching program to this type. But this is really important for us in order to, to be able to do the simulation efficiently. So that's kind of the next idea that's used. 
so I'm not going to go. The last idea is actually we need another randomization technique, which we borrowed from Bakersky and Rothblum. And with this, we, that's all the construction. So that's it. So let me just summarize. So I didn't show you anything about the proof or anything, but that's kind of the gist of the ideas that go into, into the construction. So before all this recent progress, we knew that there exists, you know, contrived functions that are not obfuscatable. We knew there exists very simple functions that are obfuscatable. We didn't know what exists in the middle. This is still the case. But we do know how to obfuscate against algebraic attacks. Still, we can, an adversary can do non-algebraic attacks. And indeed, he can do non-algebraic attacks here and kill us. But because of the naturality of algebraic attacks, it kind of, at least for me, gives me the intuition that maybe the, we can obfuscate everything else except for a few contrived examples. So I think for those who have been thinking a lot about the problem, this is our, let me speak for myself, this is my current belief. And I think my, my co-authors have a similar uh, belief. Uh, but uh, you know, this is still, so I hope that we can obfuscate most things against non-algebraic non, uh, attacks, just any attack. So there are a few counterexamples, but now my hope is, or my belief is, that actually we should be able to remove this al these algebraic attacks and just prove that, you know, constructing and prove that under strong enough cryptographic assumptions, they are, uh, it's a good obfuscation. But this is uh, uh, to be proven.